morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good mics. Well, this is a first for us. We don't have Tom Houck, and uh, it is... Uh, <laughs> And that's unusual for a couple of reasons. <coughs> Number one, we tend to be a little boring when we don't have how. As Rick Allen is fond of saying, he usually has to scotch guard his, his jackets. Uh, so we won't have to do that today. I think what makes it most unusual is that th this was a free meal. Uh, and I, I don't understand it. I, you know, the, what they always say about Tom Hauk, waiter, there, there must be some mistake. There's a check on my table. Um, I was. I was, thinking, uh, I was thinking about inviting our old friend Doug Teeper up here to sit in for Hauk. Uh, their views are somewhat similar, but uh, on the other hand, Teeper might be good and it would ruin Hauk's gig, and I don't want to do that for him. We've been together too long. Uh, just one thing in this gathering of distinguished businessmen, is there any effort here or any sentiment for taking up a collection to buy Guy Milner a jacket? <laughs> I, I know you're working for Georgia there, Guy, but uh, this casual thing is uh, it's breakfast, remember? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> you, you, all, uh, you all know what we do. Uh, we tend to try to disagree without being disagreeable. And uh, since this is, this is Cobb County and a bastion of free enterprise, I would also remind you that the Georgia Gang is seen on WAGA-TV Channel 5 at 11.30 on Sunday morning, sponsorships available. Uh, so maybe it's good that Hauk isn't here, right, Bill? All right, I thought what we'd do this morning, because we'd like to engage you in the discussion, too, I thought we'd start with kind of each of our own little overviews on the political uh, scene. And, uh, and, and we've, we've done this before, and we don't agree. Uh, but I want to start uh, with you, Rick, uh, and Jeff and Bill and I will, will uh, reserve the right to, to interrupt you, badger you, and generally throw you off your feet. Is that all right? That's perfect, yeah. All right. Uh, the question I want to start with is, is basically this. Uh, some of us think that the uh, presidential election is over, uh, that it ended on Labor Day, and uh, I'd like you to uh, volunteer your thoughts on that. Well, we've discussed it on the show a couple of times. Obviously. Clinton is, is way ahead. Uh, there was a, a survey of the states of the South at the New York Times, not the AJC, which isn't really covering the race, Jeff, um, that the New York Times put out last week, and uh, Clinton holds a, a region-wide lead of nine points over Dole. This is unprecedented. You have to go back to the days of Jimmy Carter to find a Democratic presidential candidate doing that well in the region. I think one possibility that we overlooked in our learned discussion of all this in recent days is that Clinton could be in the process of losing to Saddam Hussein. I think that might be adequate to turn this thing around. My old friend Rogers Wade and I were just talking about the excellent job that uh, Ambassador Designate Fowler is doing and making sure that American troops don't go to the, that part of the world and get killed. <laughs> Why she kept us out of war. But uh, Dick, I think just looking at this week's developments, anytime you have a Republican presidential candidate calling, uh, holding a major event uh, with his message of the day being an attack on the incumbent Democrat for not being strong enough on crime, and on that same day, the president is being embraced and endorsed by the FOP. Uh, you've got a Republican presidential candidate who is in deep, deep trouble. Bill, you, uh, you're the chief proponent of the, uh, the election is over theory. Uh, as of 8 o'clock this morning, I may have changed my mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, that, was, that was eight minutes ago. And why not have a word processor? The, uh, why not have a word processor if you can't hit delete? You're right. <laughs> the, the Mariana Daily Journal, I don't know how many of you saw it this morning, had a Mason Dixon poll, and in Georgia, there's only two percentage points difference between Dole and Clinton. More important, Jerry Keene with the Christian Coalition, a man whom I doubted seriously earlier this summer told me that Guy Milner would beat Johnny Isaacson, and I said at, the, at that time, no way. <laughs> this morning he told me that Bob Dole is going to take Georgia, and I believe him this time. Uh, 
Jeff, I forget where you are on this. Uh, yeah, I think that it's pretty much over. And the reason I think that it's pretty much over is because I don't think that Republicans feel that much of a presidential candidate. I don't think that we're hearing much in the, in the way of, of good old GOP ideas, conservative ideas. You got the tax cut proposal out there sort of swirling, but the, but, but, uh, uh, the GOP nominee, Dole, isn't really uh, selling it to the people. He isn't selling conservative ideas to the people. You know. Newt Gingrich is accused of having very high negatives. And it may be because the American people don't know him like we in this room know him. I mean, Dick and I used to sit down in the, in the cafeteria at the AJC and hear all these wacky ideas come out of his head over a cup of coffee. And then write about them. But the fact of the matter is, no matter how high his negatives are, Newt right now would be a better presidential candidate than Bob Dole because you'd have ideas out there. You'd have debate out there. You would have some interesting uh, uh, interplay going on that you, that's just not there right now. I think that if, if, if Clinton wins, last time he won by a plurality. I mean, nobody's ever given this guy a mandate. If he wins, it's going to be by default. It's going to be because Republicans didn't feel the strongest candidate. Can I just jump in? Because Please. Newt, and I realize where I'm sitting at the moment, but, and I'm a great admirer of his ideas, but he has managed to squander more political goodwill in one year than you would believe imaginable. If he were the Republican presidential candidate these days, his Secret Service detail would have to be the size of the 82nd Airborne. Well, they got people to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, I think there's something to be considered about it. Most of what my learned colleague said is, is, is true, particularly what Schiff said. I think there is a ray of hope here but uh, for the Republican side. But uh, uh, one of the problems Dole's got, and I think Jeff is reacting to it, is that, that Bob Dole and Jack Kemper are having to run against a press filter. Uh, I'm fascinated by the number of stories you see on Dole's tax cut plan. Almost none of them are straightforward expositions of it. They're all stories that say it can't be done or interviews with people who say it can't be done. And uh, so he's not getting any mileage out of the tax cut plan, which is a proven uh, Republican issue. But I do think the polls uh, have changed. And I'm, I'm not a polling expert. There are some here. I wish I understood it a little better. but, but. Uh, just in the last two weeks, the thing has become like a six to seven point race. And, and, and you're not seeing that in the, in the national press, but it is there. ABC kissed it off the other night uh, with about a 10 second thing on it. But, but remember this, as law, character is not an issue. I mean, Bill Clinton, most of you wouldn't have him in your homeowners association. <laughs> <laughs> That table wasn't applauding. <laughs> but the economy is okay. Unemployment is flat. The stock market is setting records. Nobody cares about Whitewater, Jennifer Flowers, or anything else as long as their pocketbooks are. Right. Let the pocketbook turn sour, and we'll start looking at Clinton's more. Man, it's not going to happen in six weeks. I mean, a lot can happen in six well, weeks, but may. the economy ain't going to turn south in six we, weeks. We had a credit card record yesterday. So many people are delinquent on their credit cards and spent up to the limit. That may not kick in in six weeks, but that's going to kick in. People are going to stop spending, and it's about time for a little economic We we'll look for it after the election. You know what, Dick? I'm not so sure that we're focusing on the right election. I think we should be focusing on House and Senate races, U.S. House and Senate races, because we don't know which way that's going to go, and it's a heck of a lot tighter race than the presidential. Good segue, Jeff. <coughs> well, excuse me, no, I, 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 I just, Dick, I, I want to pick a little bit of a bone with you before we leave the presidential race, because I, I know you believe that the national media are liberal and are fans of Clinton, and uh, no lie, it's true, uh, but there are also vast numbers of national media, in including a writer we all admire a great deal, Maureen Dowd of the New York Times, who are of Clinton's generation, who know him. You went to school with him, so you have a personal view of him. And I think on that level, there's an incredible level of, of antipathy toward him. Uh, th these are people his age, of his experience, who know that he's lying about a lot of things. And I thought it, there was a spectacular moment that occurred last week that shouldn't go unremarked. And that is when a member of the national press actually asked the president's press secretary if he had ever been treated for a sexually transmitted disease hey, in a public press conference. That? 
you know, if, if you think they're all out to really I protect him. long overdue, by the way. <laughs> 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 Here's a guy who hadn't released his health records to people. I, I, I thought it was shocking and inappropriate, and I wish I'd asked it myself. <laughs> there, 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 there is a vast cultural gap here, I think we should note. I mean, many of us are concerned about that first note of the fall that comes home from the school principal that, that tells us that a case of head lice has been uh, found in our child's school, uh, which I find one of the more uh, disturbing things in my year. Uh, but uh, the White House has far greater concerns. <laughs> uh, I know this is breakfast. I shouldn't have done that. But, uh, uh, well, let, let's, let's swing to the House and Senate. And let me just start here. I, uh, I am now convinced, uh, and I reserve the right like Bill to change my mind any morning, depending on the condition I'm in when I wake up and uh, what polls are on the Internet. But I, but I do think that uh, the Republican control of the House is fairly safe. Uh, I, the, the ballot test question is, is interesting. I don't remember in my 30-year career Republicans leading in the generic ballot test tech question for as long as they are. They're leading by about a point. That almost never happens. And so I think Republican, and then, of course, the ballot test doesn't mean as much as the individual races. And when I look at, the, at, the, at uh, Gingrich's effort to control the House of Representatives, I remind myself that there are, the Democrats have 36 open seats to defend, and uh, the Republicans have far fewer. And the 19 of those seats are in the South. And uh, we all know the trends here are just unavoidable. I don't see how the Democrats get control back. Uh, and I think the nation isn't ready for Speaker Gephardt or, or Mr. Bonnier as well. But you have to remember this. To effectively control both houses, the Republicans or the Democrats must have 60 members in the Senate. And they have no chance of winning 60 members in the uh, Senate. They are seven seats short, short and aren't going to pick it up. They've got to pick up a, uh, the Democrats in the House have, have got to pick up a net of 20 seats, and they have almost no chance of doing that. So you're going to pretty well have the same balance of power in the Congress that you have now. Well, Brother Bill, stay right with you for a minute. Uh, how would you assess the chances of the uh, temp talent tycoon Guy Milner? Resilient Okay, Max Cleveland, in my book, has put up the best television spots of the year, and maybe the best television spots I've seen in a long, long time. He's got a lot to work with. He's a genuine hero, a triple amputee, one of the finest motivational speakers I have ever heard. Having said that, he has a lot of baggage. And whether Mr. Milner and his able campaign strategist, Tom Perdue, is able to stick that baggage on him, uh, I'm not sure. Without getting any well, stuck without, on them? Without getting it stuck on them. Because he was inoculated in that primary by two senatorial candidates, one of whom attacked his wheelchair, which I thought was a little unusual, but by <laughs> his wheelchair for a political uh, game, and the other made some reference to a sex tape that he'd been involved in. By doing that, it seems to me that they made him immune to charges of that kind. So the, the, the Milner campaign is going to be confined to attacking him on issues. And there are many issues to attack him on, but they are complicated. It'd be hard to offset the sympathy you have. Jeff, you, you and I agree, though, that uh, something Milner's doing that I wasn't interested in at first is starting to get, get some traction, at least around the state. The AJC, of course, isn't covering the race. but. Uh, the, the, uh, Why do y'all like to pick on the AJC? Well, because well, you're ex-AJC years. <laughs> the newspaper most out of step with its readers of any major market in the nation. But, uh, <laughs> to hammer at this issue of Cleland not wanting to appear in debates and, and forums, because as Bill suggested, people don't know what Cleland stands for. They don't know what he stands for. I mean, you know, when you're Secretary of State and your job is to uh, issue dri uh, driver's licenses and, and, and license plates, uh, it doesn't much lend itself to uh, whether uh, you approve of a flat tax or a tax cut or a stronger defense. And Clayland hasn't gotten those views out there, and I think that he needs to get those views out there. One way, a good way, uh, and an uh, ineffective way, it seems to me, to do it, would be to start engaging in some debates all across the state. In fact, 
uh, after uh, Mr. Milner won the runoff, uh, Cleland's campaign wrote to the Milner campaign and said, right away, let's do this. Let's get some debates going. Um, debates will best serve the public. And then, all of a sudden, he didn't want to debate. I think that it's unconscionable, it seems to me. It's a real disservice to the people of this state who want debates. One has been scheduled. It's like eight or nine days before the election. That's not enough. It's not enough time for people to make an informed decision here. They ought to be debating all over so that we can hear what the issues are in this campaign. Frankly, I don't think that we've heard enough of the issues from either side the Republican side or the Democratic side. And we need to know where these people stand. The best way to do it is in debates. Rick, uh, you, don't, you don't agree with me on that. You think Cleveland can skate through, do you? Um, well, just a, a couple of observations. First of all, through, excuse me. Uh, well, I wanted to get my licks in on the newspaper. I think they're doing a brilliant job of putting out a newspaper for people who don't read. Um, <laughs> I'm used to it, folks. <laughs> they do it all the time. They do it all day long. Apropos right. of nothing, my, my all-time favorite as they, as they stepped into their new graphic era was, uh, was a small map on the front page of the morning rag that said Atlanta. It said, it said over here it said Los Angeles, and over here it said Atlanta. And it said, you are here. <laughs> Thanks for which, that. Which, which way was the arrow pointing? Uh, the arrow points only one way to the left. One way. Uh, well, <laughs> quickly on the subject of debates, uh, I mean, I don't know that uh, Mr. Milner has much standing to demand debates after not exactly having been a debating fool in uh, some of his earlier campaigns. James Morgan smiles broadly. Smiling broadly. Um, <laughs> Bill, you used an interesting word uh, a minute ago, inoculation. And I think that Max Cleland, we, we previewed one of his ads on our show last Sunday uh, that, that uh, shows that he is a, a severely wounded war hero. And that's a, a, a good, what we call a bio ad to introduce him to people. And you can see that he's made a tremendous sacrifice for his country. Uh, I've questioned the effectiveness of that ad because Bob Dole is a wounded war veteran who sacrificed for his country, and nobody seems to care very much about that. But Max's other ad that's just been running in the last few days, I think is, it's, it's brilliant and it's also a bit shameless, uh, and it's what we call an inoculation ad. Max is anticipating uh, an attack of, of some sort, the thrust of which would be, this guy is a garden variety, typical liberal Democrat who sees government as the answer to everything. Why, look, he's been in government his whole life, he's been on the public payroll. He's never run a private business. So I'm, I'll write the uh, text for you later if you want, guy. Uh, <laughs> a freebie. But, but anticipating that kind of attack, uh, here is uh, uh, Max saying, I could have become a ward of the state, but I didn't. I, I went out and got on with my life, and I don't believe government can solve all problems. Uh, it's a great pitch. Now, whether people are going to buy that on behalf of somebody who is, in fact, a career politician, I don't know. But that's where I think the next part of this battle is going to get fought out. Hey, it's, it's pretty obvious why he's declining to debate for the same reason the guy didn't debate Johnny a lot. He <clears throat> believes, and he is, pretty far ahead in the polls. So why should he expose himself to getting cut up? I think he believes that. I also think that he believes that the heavy hitter Democrats, including possibly Sam Nunn will weigh in on his side as the campaign goes on, and he'll move away so that he doesn't have to subject himself to a debate. And, you know, it's a practice among the Georgia gang. We've been doing this for years, and we joke about it, but we, uh, each of us in our own columns, uh, I've never figured out whether it's slow day or what, but we like to elevate obscure congressional candidates to, uh, to uh, uh, hero status. Uh, Bill Shipp, for years, uh, found uh, worthy opponents for Newt Gingrich in the old 6th District, only to see them... Uh, uh, get Crandall Bray. Crandall Bray. <laughs> sorry, An immortal. The immortal Crandall Bray. Bill Schiff. The commission chair. Rick and I used to joke about this giant figure striding across West Georgia uh, to smite Newt Gingrich. But I want to, uh, and I, I, I want to vary that a little bit this morning. I, I'm not going to say that Mr. Coles is that fellow this time, but I do think that where we're going to see a little bit of an upset is in the 4th Congressional District, where I think another of our guests today, Mr. John Mitnick, uh, has a has an absolutely fabulous chance of unseating Cynthia McKinney. And I think that... <laughs> uh, I've written a 
column about it for this week. It's interesting. I live in a part of the fourth district that currently is in the sixth district, and uh, I call that the the uh, whiplash part of the fourth. Uh, and I know in my neighborhood association this summer, uh, every couple of days somebody would come up to me and say, "God dang, are we in the fourth district?" And you say, "Yep." And uh, you see those people <laughs> rushing out to find where they could get a Mitnick bumper sticker. Uh, so I, I think uh, John uh, uh, has some polling information that shows among voters who are tuned into the race and who have a real voting history, he's got a slight lead. Uh, overall, I think John trails in the, in the general public opinion test. But Bill, what we don't really know in the fourth district is it, it's, it's going to be a, it's, it's a big turnout question. Black turnout was huge in the Democratic primary. Yeah, the black turnout and the female turnout in the Democratic primary mm -hmm. was huge, and for a couple of reasons. Not only was Cynthia McKinney on the ticket, but Leona Levitan was on the ticket also, and that helped motivate the, the women voters. That, that district is a Democratic district. It has a 35% black vote. Not it anymore. Has huge, it has, has a huge white liberal vote. So a district has Doug Teeper. Uh, just figure it has a Democratic yeah. You rest your case. <laughs> you rest your case, there it is. <laughs> but you have another problem there. Much of that white liberal vote is centered around Emory. Much of it is Jewish. Cynthia McKinney has kind of played footsie with Farrakhan. She scares a lot of people, a lot of white people, a lot of white Jewish people. I think that that could be the swing vote that helps Mitnick. Well, let me say, first of all, that John Mitnick, uh, in our endorsement interviews, was one of the finest candidates, Republican or Democratic, that we interviewed this, uh, this, this election season. Uh, just hands down. John, John, Mitnick, John Mitnick came prepared, and it's, it, it's always good to see somebody who's offering themselves for public office be prepared for that office. And we think that he's, he's, he's completely compa uh, prepared, and, and we endorsed him, of course. Uh, so you how's be, that for the uh, journal? We, be, we being the journal. Well, you know, I can't speak for that other paper. Um, <laughs> that said, you know, when they told us that that district was 30 percent black or 35 percent black, what they were looking at was 1990 census figures, and it is now almost 1997. And let me tell you, there's been a lot of movement. There's been a lot of movement out. White families going to Gwinnett and to Cobb, and there's been a lot of movement in black families coming from around the nation and from around the metro area. It ain't 30 to 35 percent black anymore. It's a heck of a lot blacker than that. Cynthia McKinney's a strong draw. Everybody's going to go to the polls to vote for Bill Clinton in that district, I think, and they're going to just pull that Democratic ticket. So it's, this is not a no-brainer for John Mitnick, and I think that he's well aware of it. But it's a test. It's a crucial test because we've been lied to for a long time. And the lie has been that whites will not vote for black in a congressional district, in a congressional campaign. It was a lie. I think that it's going to be a lie in the fourth when you see some people, maybe it'll be just those dedicated liberals around Druid Hills and whatnot, but also in the second district with Sanford Bishop, going to see the test whether or not white Georgians will vote for a black candidate. And it seems to me that they might give them the margin in John's district. And it seems to me that Bishop, who's moderated, who's, who's served those people well in the second district, farmers, peanut industry, and others, is going to do well there with his constituents. And, and, and the Tyrone Brookses of Georgia are going to have to sit down and come up with another battle plan to figure out how they're going to draw new lines along the basis of race, because this is going to blow their theory. Rick, I know you're an expert in the 4th District. Uh, yeah, where care? is it again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting because the, Jeff's absolutely right. That is the, 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 the 1996 census, if there were such a thing, would show the district, I believe, to be close to 45 percent black, uh, yeah. the fourth district. And uh, I, I don't know. It's, it, I've just got this feeling Mitnick can pull this thing off, Rick. Well, we were just a, at, at breakfast a, a, after he introduced himself, agreeing he has the perfect campaign slogan. I'm running against Cynthia McKinney. <laughs> Get those bumper stickers out there. Uh, let me do a little quick piece of history that uh, inspired by Jeff's observations. The last time Andy Young ran for Congress in the 5th, he got 38% of the white vote. When he ran for governor of Georgia some years later, he didn't quite make 10% and was used as, as an example of the assertion that whites won't vote for a black candidate. I believe what had happened to Andy Young in the interim is that he'd become associated with a liberal or black, quote unquote, political agenda. 
And I think that's the issue with Cynthia McKinney. Uh, she is a, an attractive candidate. She's friendly and uh, unthreatening when you meet her. Uh, you have to be told that she stands for certain things to get a little bit nervous about her and think, whoa, this is a liberal, almost radical figure. The fact that she has been militant, Dick, in trying to hold on to her district, I don't believe is held against her because I think it's expected of all politicians because people are uh, bored with and somewhat appalled by redistricting. It's sausage being made. So the mere fact that she wants a majority black district, I don't think, uh, makes her uh, unacceptable in the eyes of, of the voters. Uh, Mitnick's going to have to go out and make the case, and I don't believe it's been made yet, that she's a bomb thrower. And if that happens, then I think the things that you're talking about could come true. Otherwise, so. Cynthia's going back to, uh, to Congress. Final thought here. I want to open it up to you. Let's open it up to these microphones or just shout. I don't, you know, whatever, whatever issues you all want to discuss. Yes, sir. Actually, I kind of agree with you. I, if you. If you put this libertarian presidential candidate, Harry Brown, I'm fascinated by the guy. If you put him into these debates, uh, yeah, the Green Party guy, yeah, Nat Nader, right? Yeah. But I, I, you're right. And by the way, on health insurance, I think, I think that the nation took a wrong turn on that, and uh, I don't think we're ever going to go back to it, unfortunately concept of employee ownership. Let me say, though, that, and I agree with you about health care, and I think that's going to be an ongoing debate, and uh, I, I would not be surprised to see us reverse field on that portability thing. But the purpose of the presidential debates, as I see them and as I understand them, is to put to pit the people who are likely to be elected. Well, uh, come November, either Bob Dole or Bill Clinton is going to get enough votes to be the next president. Ross Perot is not, neither is Ralph Nader. So if you look at the debates as a contest between the, the two candidates, uh, I think the right decision has been made. Having said that, though, I'm not sure exactly what purpose the debates serve anymore. We've got so many spin doctors and consultants that it turns out to be a test of glibness and how well a candidate can remember the lines that were put in his ear by uh, by some consultant. So I'm not quite sure what they serve. And if you look at the audience, uh, the audience is diminishing since the days of the Nixon-Kennedy debate. And I don't think in the long run they make a lot of difference. Well, boy, well, I, Lee, I couldn't I, disagree with you yeah, more. You I, want to disagree more? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll disagree with that. I mean, Bob Dole was sitting watching uh, TV 20 years ago when the guy at the head of his ticket, Jerry Ford, tried to free Eastern years. Europe. Well, uh, <laughs> I, and more recently, Bill, I think we all remember when, when Ronald Reagan wandered off down the Pacific Coast Highway in a debate, and for a, a brief time there, it seemed that it, uh, an impregnable lead might actually be in some doubt. But, Car but, but he beat Carter in the long run with one short piece of glibness in which he said, there he goes again. Yeah. There you that, go again, That Chef. is all anybody remembers about that debate. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with that Where's part of it, bins? but I think these debates are useful. <laughs> and I, I want to make a quick point that uh, 
I think there's a reason that, that Ross Perot is way down in the polls and not being taken nearly as seriously, aside from the fact that he's obnoxious and nobody likes listening to him anymore. Uh, and that is that there, you know, the American people love, the voters love to complain about gridlock, but I think in a way they sort of like the idea in this particular election cycle. They, they see Clinton headed for apparent re-election. Uh, they're going to re-elect him. There's, there's a certain terror in the idea of a Bill Clinton with four years to operate without uh, having to face the voters again. Uh, people aren't exactly sure what will jump out of the box if that happens. Uh, one way of preventing mischief is to have a Republican Congress and I th that will act as a break on him and not get anything done. And I think one reason people have a renewed appreciation of gridlock is the very health care debate that, that took place when we, we got a glimpse of the idea of the president's wife uh, refashioning and putting government in charge of a sixth of the American economy and said, whoa, that is too big a step to undertake. Let's, let's draw back and not do anything quite that, that rash. Uh, so I, I think there's, you know, there's a reason that, that, that the Perot is down as far as he is in the polls, and that's it. Well, I think, uh, Bill, let me disagree with you, because I, something is telling me this year that the, that the public is not really engaged in this election yet. Uh, and I think the debates, you know, there's something going on with the way we absorb political information and media right now, and I, I'm not astute enough to fully analyze it. But I, I think that these debates are going to mark the start of the public's real focus on the race. That gives Dole a chance at that point to set up the head-to-head -head comparison. The guy you wouldn't elect uh, treasurer or homeowner. You know, it is a comparison, it is a comparison of show people. And, the sh and, and Bill Clinton beats Bob Dole by a mile as a showman. He, he, that's he, right, he that's right. Look, look, there is an element of entertainment in it. Well, you know, people tell us, you know, when we are really going at it, and we got Hauk here, and, 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 and Chip is throwing his notebook at him, as he had done in the past. You know, folks say, we love those shows. And our producers are in the back shouting, screaming at us, saying, nobody can understand what you're saying. You're all talking at the same time. Those are the ones that people like. There's an entertainment value associated to it. There isn't a campaign. This one is boring. It's just that simple, because ideas aren't getting out there. And that's why people aren't engaged in it. They're not hearing any ideas from the Republicans. The Democrat is skating, and Perot is just, he's, he's, he's yesterday's meat. You know, he's, he was from four years ago. Nobody cares anymore about Perot. But I think that we need those debates. When, when, when Bernie Shaw asked uh, uh, Dukakis uh, uh, what he would do if his wife was raped, you know, I mean, this gets the juices flowing, you know? Everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat waiting for this guy to respond. What's he going to say? Those are the kinds of issues that we need to get into, whether they're personal, whether they're policy, whatever. They've got to be out there this time, not yet. They're not there. We don't have the best people running. Jack Kemp endorsed somebody else, remember? Steve Forbes. Jack Kemp should be at the front of his ticket, <laughs> not Bob Dole. Colin Powell, we got better people out there who, are, who, who, who would make this a more interesting race, yes, and Newt, who would make this a more interesting race than Bob Dole is, a more entertaining race, and a race that more people would be interested in. All right, we got any more questions? Can I just add a footnote yeah. that I just think is so fun, because uh, uh, I was at CNN back in 1988 when, when Bernie was, Shaw was preparing for that debate, and he, the night before, he sat down with all the officials, the League of Women Voters, and some network folks and the other panelists, and they said, well, you, you got the first question, what are you going to ask? And he told them, and they said, you can't ask that. <laughs> Bernie, Bernie, for those of you who know, is an ex-Marine and, and a very focused individual and not easily dissuaded once he gets something uh, on his mind. He said, yeah, I'm going to ask it. He said, you can't. It's inappropriate. He said, I don't care. And off he went and he made history with it. Mm -hmm. All right. Doug, get, get, get up there, my friend. We've been pillorying you a little bit. Yes, I, I'm Doug Seifert, the Sam Nunn of the Cab County. <laughs> 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 um, I want to ask you about a hot rumor that is gaining great currency, and that rumor is that when and if uh, Bill Clinton gets reelected, that the great governor of Georgia, uh, Zell Miller, will leave Georgia and become possibly Secretary of Education, leaving in the middle of his term. And uh, I'd like you to extrapolate upon that. 
<laughs> Governor, uh, Governor Miller uh, was going to become Secretary of Education during Walter Mondale's administration. <laughs> 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 that didn't work out. <laughs> Word has it this time that he's going to leave before the end of his term, possibly after the next legislative session, and become Secretary of Education. That gives Pierre Howard a real leg up to become the next governor. He would become acting governor and be the incumbent. However, Governor Miller has told his friend that he has no intention of doing that and, and plans to serve his term out. However, again, he also said he would serve only one term. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, Doug. A lot of Pierre Howard's people uh, turned uh, that rumor into a fervent wish. <laughs> I think a, a lot of the nation's English teachers. Uh, <laughs> 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 All those poor people. There's this great debate about whether you, whether you teach whole language or phonics. If you teach phonics, Mazelle Miller is Secretary of Education. Poor people just wouldn't understand it. Yeah, back here, yeah. At least, at least he's written books, Dick. We have had some governors of this state who don't read books. Well, but, can, uh, I, can, I, can I quote my favorite Georgia governor of all time? Joe Frank Harris, who always said, we was always in favor of a quality basic education. <laughs> <laughs> ahead, I don't like it. That's exactly what I'm for, but it'll never happen. Uh, anybody have a thought on well, that? Well, remember PACs. Remember, everybody says PACs are the worst thing that's happened. Remember why we have PACs. PACs were instituted as reform to stop, people, stop corporations from directly giving to candidates. The only way we're going to ever have candidate reform is to limit the duration of the campaigns and to put caps on spending. No incumbent is going to approve that. I'm with you, Dick. I, I, I like uh, unfettered giving and complete and full disclosure. And I'd also like to see the Supreme Court reverse itself and say that individuals cannot give massive buckets of their millions to their own campaigns. Uh, see, Milner's already gone to spend another million or two, but we'd save, we'd save him a little bit of money. It seems to me if a guy, if a, if a man or a woman gives money to themselves, I, I think that's evidence that they have faith in what they're doing. I, I don't know about you. Yeah, I agree. Teresa, uh, Christina. I agree. I, I think that money is and should be the mother's milk of politics, because our side has more of it. That's right, but you'd be surprised at what little this, this panel here can demand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, demand and, is an oxymoron. And, and the fear is always that whatever we demand, uh, the opposite will be granted. So uh, we don't make any demands. Um, I think uh, the pressure's gonna build on Cleland, I, I, I do. I think he's gonna have to agree to more than just the GCTV debate. Uh, and uh, there are some proposals circulating 
Uh, and we'll, I, I think he's going to have to. Bill, what do you think? He, in this day and age, can he? How long can he stick to this? Uh, I think Miller will close the gap, and he will finally see that he's not as comfortable as he thinks he will, and he will agree. Let me say on those Milner Isaacson debates, you're exactly right. They had a lot of forums. As long as there was a full field of candidates, they got into the runoff. It became a different story. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> Thank Good God point. for Mississippi, I believe. <laughs> appropriate to say at this point. Richard Guthman, as I live and breathe. Where you been? Thank you, David. Not changing your train of thought. Absolutely. Probably not. <laughs> Time we well, I, I, so I think early. Marvin Arrington, who's the president of the city council now, is going to launch a very formidable campaign. I think Bill Campbell has all kinds of problems. I was appalled to learn we had 250 police vacancies during the Olympics where security was the primary problem. He didn't want to fill those vacancies because he was using that money for other agencies to hold down property taxes. That is appalling to me. It's appalling to me they failed to address the problems of the river. I think this is going to be a good campaign, and it's a very important campaign for all of us out here in the suburbs because Atlanta continues to be the economic engine. The, the region continues to be the economic engine for the state. We, uh, we got a couple of things going from us. I'm from Detroit, where uh, uh, a suburban community called East Detroit changed its name to East Point because it didn't want to be associated with Detroit. <laughs> so that's one of the things that we've got going for us, and that is, you know, when you're in Switzerland, you say you're from Atlanta, not from Smyrna. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that's one of the things. But, but the other thing is, like most urban areas, we have an incredible shrinking city. It's getting smaller and smaller. Fewer people are voting in it. Fewer people are seeking its services. Uh, uh, fewer people are living in it. And, and uh, uh, as a result, I think that its power base and its economic engine diminishes considerably. You know, the, what's the guy's name who wrote uh, uh, Edge Cities? Uh, Joel, Joel Garrow. Garrow, right, exactly. And we've got several. We have a couple in Atlanta, Midtown, Buckhead, and then up here, uh, well, perimeter, right here. And, and, and right here, exactly right. And, and that's where the growth is, is spreading to in the metro area. The metro area as a whole takes on much more importance, it seems to me, and the core city, not just here, but in every metropolitan area around the nation, uh, is, 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 is not nearly as significant economically or politically as it used to be. So do you think Arrington can beat Campbell, Jeff? I'm not going to let you duck it like that. You know, it's an, this is probably one of the most interesting races because both of these people have such strong support in the grassroots. Bill Campbell gets out a lot. Uh, not just the basketball games. I always used to see him at halftime on the, bas on the floor. Like he knew all the basketball players. But he gets out to everything. He's at birthday parties and this party and that party. And that, too, is where Marvin's strength is. It's in the grassroots. It's not necessarily in the business community. It's with little folks on the street that they've known for 20 and 30 years. So it's going to be a very interesting race because, in large part, they're competing for the same vote. Well, Rick, uh, you, you wrote the book, uh, Atlanta Rising, the uh, best-selling uh, <coughs> current uh, history of Atlanta in the last 50 years, available uh, from Longstreet Press at bookstores near you. Uh, Thank you, you, Dick. To, uh, <laughs> would you care to say that uh, question? Well, let's just start with something that amazed me this week uh, that was in the newspaper, that, that the Fulton County schools now have more kids than the Atlanta schools. The Atlanta school district, I think, has dropped to fifth largest. Uh, you know, that's just kind of shocking if you've spent the last 25 years, as I have, covering city politics, and uh, I think I'm the only one on the panel here who actually lives inside the city and pays those sweet property taxes. Uh, it is getting a lot smaller, but I think the Olympics were a, a, a perfect example of 
where Atlanta is and also how the election is going to go. Uh, the city did not perform particularly well. The fandango of the 911 call uh, you know, was not news to any of us, but it certainly was news to a, a lot of the rest of the world that it, it didn't work well. Uh, and yet, I think Campbell did a very good job of, of representing the city in, in a time of pain after the bombing. I thought he uh, stepped forward and acquitted himself well in a symbolic uh, leadership sort of way. Uh, having said all that, I think the, the election is going to be a campaign of, it's going to be a dirty one, uh, centering on scandals. I'm, I'm sure that whoever does the TV commercials for Campbell will have a, an excellent and fun time uh, rerunning that footage of Marvin putting the bills into his pocket. Uh, I think that'll be of keen interest to people. As long as Campbell doesn't do anything uh, truly egregious to permanently alienate and offend the black uh, electorate in Atlanta, I think he gets reelected because it's seen as his job to lose. Uh, we, did have, we did have one leading politician in Atlanta who managed to offend both black and white voters, and that was Michael Lomax. Uh, it can be done, and sometimes, <laughs> uh, sometimes I think Campbell is intent upon doing all of that, but so far I think he's okay with the black voters, uh, and that will probably there, see him There through. will be a little event. Uh, next spring in Atlanta that could help just, decide this issue, and it is word. called Freak Nick 97. Yeah. yeah, Arrington strength uh, uh, could rise depending on how many carloads of uh, kids come in here to do the uh, Tupac Shakur, whatever thing they do. All right, we've got a, uh, yes sir, uh, Senator Tanksley, you've got the last question. I want to switch back to Nashville. Good. I want to try to be as nonpartisan as I can understand. Sure, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> we had a talk event about Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, old age survivors. Thank you. Uh, uh, both of them parts of that, that fund. We spent a quarter of a billion dollars on national defense, and we generally provide security for, for advanced, wealthy, industrialized countries in Europe and Asia. All this stuff has to do with the budget and the financial crisis. And we hadn't talked about it for a second. When our candidates talk about it, Well, I, Charlie, let me take a, take a whack at that because uh, uh, Gingrich is uh, abysmal standing uh, nationally in, in, in the polls is largely the result. Uh, I mean, sure, he made a lot of his problems himself, but, but it's largely a result of his, his and the Republicans' good faith efforts to try to correct uh, some of that ominous financial cloud that's out there. And I think that. And I, that's right. I think they're scared to death of it now. And Gingrich, twice in his career, has tried to do things like that. Early in his career in Congress, he actually talked out loud about different ways of handling Social Security, and he was almost defeated for re-election. And this time, he took a straightforward run at, uh, at the Medicare and Medicaid business, and, uh, and look what he's gotten for it. Uh, so uh, I, I think that it's only going to be nipped at at the margins, no matter who's elected. And I don't think that the ongoing crisis gets resolved. I, I think it has to reach real crisis proportion, in which we have to say the, tr the non-existent trust fund is going bankrupt next week. And then we'll move to solve it. And before then, we will not, because we, we, we uh, and Dick is absolutely right. Gingrich is down in the polls, and Dole are, is losing primarily because old folks, old women, if you will, we're frightened of these people. The gender gap, if you look at it very closely, comes in older women, women who are looking to Medicare and Social Security, and the Republicans have scared them, and the Democrats have, have reinforced such problems. You know, m more young people believe there are UFOs than believe that they'll get Social Security. <laughs> And, and, and so that, that I, I think that this is one of the reasons why people have tuned out because they're not, politicians are not focusing on the real, meaty issues like the one that you just brought up. 
Medicaid, Medicare, these incredibly increasing, expanding bureaucracies and programs. I mean, Medicare is out of sight. It's unbelievable. Social Security isn't going to be here. I have to pay into that thing for the next 24 years. And it'll, you know, by then, the retirement age will probably be 85. <laughs> Make it 34 years. I mean, it's crazy. And we're not talking about it. And who doesn't, with half a brain, know that we're not talking about it? The electorate knows. They know that these issues are out there and that they're not being broached by anybody. And that when they are broached, somebody's head gets chopped off and you never see them again. It's not just that. It's with everything. We had a kid uh, uh, in New York City, I believe, who uh, died from starvation. She was four years old, weighed 15 pounds. Her mother was pregnant with the ninth. She was on welfare. Where are these issues being talked about? New Gingrich talked about orphanages. Got his head chopped off. We can't talk about issues. And knowing that we're not going to talk about real issues, people tune out. And that's where we are. I think it's a hell of a problem. And we need to solve it. We need to get back to some of these, instead of uh, a crisis a week away and, and, and going bankrupt in a week, we need to, we, we need to uh, you know, sort of cut some of this, this last, stuff off at the head. Last thought on that, Ray? Well, let, let me follow that yeah. eloquent statement with something glib and silly. I, I would just point out that when you look in the memorial in Washington, it doesn't say Abe Lincoln, he balanced the budget. It doesn't say George Washington, he, he, he projected the, the budget uh, well into the next fiscal year. Uh, I think the, the problem with it, Charlie, is they are talking about these things, but it's all very abstract. It deals with the economy off into the future. Uh, the temptation to attack on, on both sides through fear tactics for immediate political gain are, are great. Uh, it's easy to scare people because it is scary, and uh, while I, I think Jeff is, is right about what ought to be, I think Bill is right about what is, and that is that it will take a crisis because uh, in the interim the prospect of giving Americans bad tasting medicine uh, for a disease they don't think they have yet uh, is just not going to happen. All right, well this is a very productive group and we don't want to have you all too late to uh, get your part in restoring the economic health of the country, so we'll leave you with, uh, <laughs> we'll leave you with uh, two thoughts from the, from the uh, Georgia gang. Uh, this is not a demand, it's just a suggestion. At 11.30 on Sunday morning, uh, <laughs> you are allowed to skip church. We, we give you a dispensation that you're allowed to watch us, and uh, because I know most of you cannot program a VCR. Uh, <laughs> most of you face the blinking light more often than not. And finally, we'll leave you with the motto of the Georgia gang, and, and that is this, always be kind to your children, because they're the ones who pick the nursing home. <laughs>